I'm here with my guests, Eve Polonis, Connie Potter, and Natalie Rayner of Keller and Heckman LLP, and they're here to discuss fermentation-based proteins. Can you give a little introduction of yourselves and Keller and Heckman for our readers and listeners? Sure, thanks, Tara. This is Eve Polonis. I'm a partner in the Washington, D.C. office at Keller and Heckman. Um, I've been practicing food law for approximately 18 years or so, um, and so we, we're happy to present today on fermentation-based proteins. We're entering an interesting time with, with food with lots of different new technologies emerging. So this is just one of those interesting technologies. So look forward to speaking more with you. Hi, Tara. My name is Connie Potter. I'm an associate at Keller and Heckman in the Washington, D.C. office. And I assist both Eve and Natalie uh, joining us here today on Direct Food Matters. Um, so helping out manufacturers with labeling concerns and the regulatory status of direct food ingredients. Thanks. Uh, hi, Tara. This is Natalie Reiner. I'm a partner in our San Francisco office and uh, have been in uh, the food law arena for about 13 years now and um, have been getting more and more requests from clients interested in bringing fermentation-based foods to market. Um, so I'm really excited about this area and excited to talk to you today about our article. So for our viewers and listeners that aren't aware of what a fermentation-based protein is, can you give us a little definition of that? Sure, happy to. Um, so fermentation has been used in the food industry for quite a long time. It's um, historically, the traditional use of fermentation was microbial fermentation. So that would be um, where you just use live intact microorganisms to produce raw materials into other food products. So to process raw materials into other food products. So for example, when you take lactic acid bacteria, you can convert milk into cheese and yogurt. So we're not, you know, that's historically what fermentation has been used in as, you know, how it's been used in the food industry. What we're talking about now are newer ways of using fermentation to produce food ingredients. So we've got things like biomass fermentation, and that's where you are producing protein from microorganisms that grow rapidly to produce the high protein microorganism based food ingredients. Second way fermentation is now being used is precision fermentation. And this is where things get kind of interesting because here we're, what we are seeing is where you're using microorganisms to produce specific ingredients. So you're isolating proteins um, for use as food ingredients and then removing, often removing the production organism. Um, and what's interesting with all of this is it, it enables companies to make um, either identical or substantially identical proteins that are um, you know, that are not animal derived, but that are, you know, the same as an animal derived protein. So whereas, you know, this is exciting because it raises the um, availability of these proteins um, from a non-animal source, it's also, it also raises some interesting uh, safety and labeling issues that my uh, colleagues will discuss in the, in the next part of this interview, I believe. It's a great segue. So what are some of the safety concerns with fermentation-based proteins? Yeah, hi, this is Connie. Um, so I'm happy to discuss a couple of the, the key considerations that manufacturers getting into this space would wanna consider. Um, so there are three primary safe areas of safety concern that, that manufacturers will be looking at when they're, when they're looking to get a fermentation-based food approved. The first and the most important is the safety of the production organism. So to consider the safety or the safety of the production organism used to produce the protein, it's going to be a lot easier for manufacturers to show its safety if that if that organism has a long history of safe use in food or if it's the subject of published safety data. But for organisms that don't have as long a history of safe use in food or that need to, they're going to need to generate additional safety data to, the, to show the safety of the production organism um, that doesn't have a long history of safe use in food, they're going to want to consider the allergenicity or the pathogenicity of the production organism. 
In addition to showing the safety of the production organism, manufacturers will also want to consider the safety of the target protein that's being used for the food. Um, for proteins produced via precision fermentation, manufacturers will most easily be able to support the safety of that protein when it's identical to a conventional counterpart. For instance, a protein that's already commonly used in food rather than a protein that's different than that conventional counterpart. But if a manufacturer does need to show similarity or to show that the one protein is similar to a conventional counterpart, the manufacturer is going to use both a structural assessment or a nutritional assessment to show that the two proteins are similar and that both are safe for use in food. And then the final safety component that manufacturers want to consider are, is the safety of the fermentation media used. Uh, that's the substance that's fed to the microorganisms. Um, and we'll also just want to ensure that every component of that, that substance is safe. And for producers that want to start making fermented based proteins, what are some labeling considerations that they would have to look into? Thanks, Tara. This is Natalie. Um, this is one of the trickier and more interesting parts of, of uh, evaluating these types of food products. So we're entering this precision fermentation protein uh, world where you can make, uh, for example, a milk protein without a cow. So how do we communicate with consumers, particularly about proteins that are identical to the major eight uh, food allergens? So things like proteins that are identical to milk protein or egg protein. Um, it, it's an interesting issue, particularly because in the current market, we've got plant-based alternatives to some of these products, like plant-based plant alternatives to eggs and plant-based alternatives to milk um, that are side-by-side -side now with uh, fermentation-based milk proteins. Um, that have allergenicity concerns that are not relevant to those plant alternative counterparts. So uh, it, it is a challenge for these precision fermentation products to both distinguish themselves from their conventional counterparts, uh, but to also make sure that the consumer has a clear understanding, particularly about the potential allergenicity issues. Um, there aren't federal rules at this point for how to label uh, fermentation-based proteins in a different way. The same rules apply to fermentation-based foods that apply to other food ingredients. You, you're supposed to use the common or usual name for the product. But when we're talking about such innovative products, it can be difficult to know what the appropriate common or usual name is. Um, but in the absence of federal standards on these nomenclature issues, a number of states have passed laws uh, prohibiting the use of traditional dairy and meat uh, terms for non-animal derived products that include fermentation derived products. So um, just as these state rules would uh, prevent a plant-based burger from uh, being able to use the term meat in the name, um, those same rules would seek to prevent fermentation derived uh, identical proteins from using terms like meat or milk as well. Um, there has been an interesting case in California where the California Department of Food and Agriculture, CDFA, brought an enforcement action against a plant-based butter, uh, which was marketing itself as a vegan butter. Um, and CDFA said that this company, Miyoko's Kitchen, could not use the term butter on its label. And Miyoko's Kitchen sued uh, CDFA and actually won the case uh, because the judge agreed that the term vegan was sufficient to communicate to consumers that the vegan butter was not produced using 
uh, milk. So that was a win for the fermentation-based industry as well, even though um, Miyoko's Kitchen is producing a plant-based product, because the same reasoning could be used to support that appropriate terminology to adjust or amend a reference to a, a conventional protein would be sufficient to um, communicate to the consumer that it's not actually from, for example, a cow or from a chicken. Um, so it, again, this is such an innovative area of food technology that uh, there's a lot of gray areas currently. And I expect that over the next 10 years, there's going to be a lot more consumer education, a lot more consumer understanding that's going to help um, everyone understand the difference better between conventional proteins, plant-based alternatives to those proteins, and then fermentation-based proteins that are identical to conventional proteins. And if our viewers and listeners wanted to get in contact with you to seek legal counsel, how would they best reach you? Yeah, um, we are all, um, our contact information is available on our website, which is khlaw.com. Um, so K for Keller, H for Heckman, law.com. Um, our email addresses and phone numbers are there. And you can also sign up for our daily intake blog on our website where we do um, updates on current events five days a week. And you have some upcoming events available. Can you share those with our viewers and listeners? We have in October our annual food packaging law seminar, which is going to be taking place in Arlington, Virginia from October uh, 18th to 20th. On um, that first day, October 18th, we're going to be talking about uh, sustainability considerations for food packaging. And then on October 19th and 20th, um, we're going to focus on the regulation of food packaging materials. Um, so not so much the labeling, but actually the, the, the composition and FDA regulation of food packaging materials. So if that's of interest, more information is available on our website. Thank you for joining me today, and I look forward to sharing more of your information with our viewers and listeners. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Tara. Thank you, Tara.